Real questions, real answers for real life. Come on in and pull up a chair. You're at 1850 Main Street with Michael Del Giorno and David Zanotti. Have you ever gone back to the neighborhood you grew up in and seen that things just aren't the same? I've been wanting to talk with you about something. I saw an article uh, regarding Israel and actually regarding the city of Bethlehem. And according to the story that's uh, been reported in the media, it appears that the Palestinians that are in control, political control of Bethlehem, have decided to take down all the Christmas decorations as a form of protest for what the Israelis are doing in regards to Gaza and Hamas. And I thought to myself, okay, this is really odd. (laughs) And so I thought I would ask you, and, and the reason that I wanted to ask you this is because you have often talked about the experts on international terrorism and on the experts on Islam who have said to you the the phrase, first comes Saturday, then comes Sunday. So when you look at what's going on in, in this news report, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? First thing that comes to mind is the word solidarity and who's using it. Now, if these were Jewish people, uh, solidarity would be unity or agreement of feeling or action, especially among individuals with a common interest. That would make no sense whatsoever. And we could explore the differences between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, two of which are tolerant of the other's right to exist until you get to the jihadist portion of it. Um, But this is a territory that is Palestinian. What What it suggested to me was they haven't learned their lessons of giving control of their area to Hamas, who is a terrorist group, and created this conflict to begin with by attacking Israel on the 7th of October. So that would be the first thing that would jump out at me. The second thing that would jump out at me is that they're in solidarity with, and I can think of three Quranic verses, Surah 3, 151, Surah 2, 191, Surah 9, 5. There are many Hadiths, but uh, the, the surahs that would call for the death of anyone who doesn't convert. Never mind. Great Satan is always death to America. Uh, America is considered the great Satan among most of the um, Persian and, and Muslim nations. Uh, the little Satan is Israel. So this is, this is solidarity with terrorists who do not see Israel's right to exist, plan to kill every Jew, plan to kill every Christian, destroy America, and then rule the world. That's uh, Jesus's neighborhood. I mean, have you ever gone yeah. back to your neighborhood you grew up in? Yeah. Uh, uh, his neighborhood's come a long way. <laughs> yeah. So, so here's the, I mean, this, this is such an odd, odd story because for most Americans who do tourism, uh, going to Israel, I mean, that's a, I mean, internationally, it's a very, very big deal. I mean, there's, there's, there's no tourist location in the world like the, the land of Israel. All three major faiths of the world that exist all have a vested interest in the tourism and the visitation of what people would call the sacred or holy sites. And there has been a sort of um, a peaceful process in all of this where people recognize the importance of granting access. And well, that's, a, that's a very complicated question about how I mean, there you are uh, surrounded by the Wailing Wall and just w- within eyes distance, there's the Dome of the Rock. And you have these two places that are so vital in faith, but two faiths that are are not uh, congruent with one another. And I mean, this takes me back to my early studies in 1975. Uh, the first paper I wrote on the question of is Zionism racism and uh, UN Resolution 242, which is still in effect to this day. And the Islamic world refuses to recognize the right of Israel to exist. That's the predicate of everything in regards to public policy here is that Israel is illegal. They are a usurper. They are an occupying nation. And they do not have, the people of Israel do not have the right to their own nation. And they certainly don't have a right to an inch of any territory that the Palestinians consider to be their property. This is an ancient battle, an ancient war. But there's been a um, a sense of cooperation in these special places, these religious places. Uh, apparently, the, the Muslims now have decided, guess what? 
Uh, Bethlehem is within our political control as a part of the fractured infrastructure of how the Palestinians and the Jews get along inside the realm of Israel. Um, and now they're basically saying, okay, not all you Christians get out as well. And oh, by the way, Christmas is canceled in Bethlehem this year because of what the Israelis are doing in response to the attacks of Hamas upon Israel. As tempting as it is to do a Burgermeister, Meister Burger impersonation, there will be no Christmas. Um, I want to share with you, a Surah 3151 is often talked about. Uh, we shall cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. That would be all non-Muslims. Uh, Surah 2191, and kill them, all the non-Muslims, everywhere you find them, kill them. Such is the consequence of disbelief. Then there's Surah 9-5, which is probably the most quoted when it comes to jihad. Then kill the disbeliever, the non-Muslim, wherever you find them, capture them, besiege them, lie in wait for them uh, in each and every ambush. And I, and I think to myself, if we look back to the events that led to this conflict, that's exactly what they did. And so what I think is lost in the West is that you, I mean, because we all have human compassion, right, when we see this. But what's lost in the West is, is you can't, you can't politically correct, appease, and coddle an enemy on your way to victory. Uh, this would show clear solidarity uh, with this kind of behavior. And it would tell you that having that on your front porch is just not a very sustainable thing. Because wouldn't you hope they would learn from this? Clearly they're not. It's kind of a coloring book approach that I'm I'm throwing out here. I recognize this. I'm not proposing questions that are of deep, sophisticated public policy and all the layered nuances that would come from the U.S. State Department. I'm just asking an old history question. This kind of has the ring of the Crusades in it to me. I mean, this was a part of what actually precipitated the era of the Crusades, which lasted for hundreds of years where there was a sense that the Islamic world was taking over Israel, Jerusalem, and all of the properties that were considered sacred to both Jews and Christians. And people rallied in that mechanism uh, to, to defend what they believed were their sacred sites and, and, and their holy places. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that anyone returned to that mindset or mentality. I mean, the idea of let's have a, um, a, a war over who puts up Christmas no, oh, presentations in Bethlehem or who permits who to come into Bethlehem. That's a, that's that, that notion is absurd, but it's, it, I'm sorry. It just, it smacks to me of the same attitude, which says if we have power, uh, then whatever it is that we've done in the past, if we, we just, sorry, you don't, you don't have access anymore. You're, you're gone. You're out. You're done. Wow. Well, what kind of provocative, spirit is that? I mean, what do they expect to accomplish by this? Well, remember when we talked in the past about political Islam versus jihadist yeah. warlike Islam? And, and again, Muhammad, everything reflects Muhammad. Just like Christianity, everything reflects Christ. Gabriel came to Muhammad, gave him the revelation that became the Quran, the Hadith, or the sayings of Muhammad. Uh, they, of course, do not believe in the Trinity. They do not believe Jesus was divine. They do not believe he was crucified. There's a lot of differences. The thing about Muhammad was he was peaceful at first in Mecca. Um, and then he began, became very political and, quite frankly, started robbing the caravans and then ultimately became a warrior. So today we have the reflection. Mostly the Sunnis are the political Islamists until they believe it's the owl. And then the, the Shias are always jihadists first. And again, why do we have Sunnas and Shias? I don't think we've ever talked about in the past. Um, and that was their dispute over who succeeded Muhammad. And so you have two right. distinct, right. you know, sects of Islam. It almost, it's a bit of a, it's, it, in Protestant terms, it's a hyper, hyper denominational warfare. Yeah. But I will tell you this, when they believe the time is now, they all be violent. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing now, right now. It's expressed in solidarity. It's expressed in there'll be no Christmas. Christians and Jews are not allowed. We control this territory. But what would concern me far more than Christmas 
would be if uh, if Sunni Muslims believe that this is an hour uh, for war and this is an hour for all time and potentially the destruction of Israel, the destu- destruction of America, the rule of the world, followed by the hidden imam, imam's appearance, the Mahdi, that, that would be very concerning to me. And, and that would have geographic implications. Now, right now, it's just Bethlehem in the, in the Palestinian territory, but th- that would be my concern more than there's no Christmas. Michael began in talk radio over 30 years ago. David has been working in the field of public policy and media for over 40 years. They've been around and seen a lot. To learn more about Michael and David, visit 1850mainstreet.com. So the U.S. administration uh, under Joe Biden and, and his State Department and uh, Department of Defense, et cetera, all seem to have a casual approach to this. Uh, they seem to think that somehow there's a way to balance the scale between two competing groups in a region and uh, that if you just wait it out long enough, it'll all settle down. It, it, it's a very um, odd situation. Uh, there's one part of the country that seems to be shouting at the top of its lungs saying Israel is our closest ally in the Middle East and the history of the United States relationship with Israel and, and all, the, all of those things that are, that are considered to be the traditional anchor of American foreign policy in, in the Middle East. And then there's the administration that seems to be basically saying, well, let's just keep this as safe and balanced as possible. Am I Seeing this wrong is all the reading that I'm doing. It just seems like the, we might we might be it's we not might be like, reading the same thing. It, well, it's not like they're calling both sides wrong. What they're basically saying is let's just help both groups. Yeah, the, don't pick sides. Whatever you do, don't well, pick that, sides because that's that's a political problem for this president. Although I have noticed over the years, this is something that I probably wouldn't do on a normal radio show. If I'm talking to a foreign policy or military expert, I can't think of any that have ever felt comfortable about looking at these conflicts and how something bad can get worse and then be the worst. The worst would be uh, that it takes a biblical shape. So none of them are comfortable looking at it through a biblical lens. So all they'll do is talk in a historical sense or a geopolitical sense. Well, and, and I usually meet them there. All right, so if we do Joe Biden, I think he's got problems within his party. Abortion is a problem for the Republicans. Israel's a problem for Democrats. All right, so he, he's got to do something. His numbers are plummeting. He's hemorrhaging support, and it's over Israel and not calling for a ceasefire. So the question that needs to be answered is, if we have troops in a region, like Syria, for example, is it not the commander-in-chief's number one responsibility to have their back? And, and, and if you're going to deploy them there, have their back and protect them. And is he doing it? If the enemy's motive is to drive you out of that region, do you have, as a commander in chief, the priority to defend that position with force? And then finally, if the question is that the ultimate goal is to get you to turn on your main ally, which is their ultimate chief enemy, Israel, Shouldn't you be sending the kind of clear messages of solidarity that Bethlehem is sending uh, to the Palestinians? Because if you're the commander in chief, these are your responsibilities that aren't partisan, aren't political. And David, I don't have to tell you, they're not happening. And and sporadic airstrikes is just simply not doing it. So are, are we saying that we've reached a place where there is such a pro Hamas? pro-Islamic wing and division, pro-Palestinian wing and division within the Repub- the, the Democrat infrastructure that they're pressuring this administration to assist in the Palestinian effort here? Well, the president's showing proclivities to cave to it, that's for sure, which causes them to send mixed messages of support for Israel, mixed messages. And by the way, these enemies extend beyond uh, Hamas and the Palestinian territory. I mean. You've got multiple very dangerous 
Islamic jihadist organizations that are listening, nations that are existing, including Russia, China, North Korea. These are all very dangerous messages. But yeah, that would be, I'll tell you, I, I'm i sitting here, I just finished watching you as a dear friend fight one of the greatest battles I've seen fought side by side with somebody in a lifetime and lose in the moment, temporarily. And the lesson we walked away from was, for the longest time, abortion was political, and it drove the Democrat Party. And by the time we thought through the Supreme Court we had achieved something, we found out that enough time had passed that all of America has kind of lost its way. As you're asking me that question, my fear is not just that we have a a solidarity and or a or common ground to defend terrorists. We can't pick a side between Israel, freedom, and totalitarian Islamic. I mean, Islam is not just a religion. It is a government. It is a system of life. It is a way of life. And you either comply, tax, or be killed. And we're having a hard time picking a side. I'm afraid that someday we're going to wake up and find out it's not just a problem within the Democrat Party. It's an American problem. That's what scares me. It's been a long time since September 11th. That seems hard to believe because for us, it feels like it was yesterday. But it's tw- it's about to come on 23 years ago. How much have people forgotten? Which is roughly the difference between Pearl Harbor and when you and I were kids. Remember how long ago Pearl Harbor seemed when we were little? Yes. That's what it yes. seems like to the older kids. Most kids, you know, anybody, uh, what, under probably 30 don't even remember it. Well, and what's interesting is it was 9-11 that brought in into the American at- mindset and into Americans' attention the entire question of radical Islam, the history of is- Islam. Americans uh, in the last 23 years have learned a lot more about this whole situation. But now, as time goes on and on and on, you feel like that memory is shrinking. And now you look back at 9-11 and in, in that rearview mirror, it looks like There was a group of really bad people who did really bad things to America, end of conversation, and were very sad. I mean, those are like the bullet points. The the whole concept of global jihad and all that's involved in in this all around the world, it's, it's a lesson that we are forced painfully to remember over and over and over again. And in Israel, of course, it clearly, Israel hasn't forgotten. Israel was just attacked in one of the most brutal fashions in the history of their nation. Just, I mean, it's, it's absolutely horrific what happened there. But yeah, I'm Michael, I, I have to wonder, has the progressive wing of the Democrat Party completely rejected the concept that Islam is a threat? I think that they're under the belief that we are provoking them in these actions. Really? Yeah, I, I think they, I, they must believe that. Now, one of the big things nod to Francis Schaeffer, who we'll see again someday, but they've rejected God. So everything that would be clues to you as to how different they are, don't believe in the Trinity, that wouldn't offend them at all. Don't believe Christ was divine, wouldn't offend them at all. God's word, the Bible, isn't God breathed, wouldn't offend them at all. And that they have their own Bible that was inspired by Muhammad. Now, why they, they don't actually go into Muhammad's life and study it, so I guess that would fall under ignorance. They tend to think that they could find common ground or there was something you could give them that would please them, which is naive. In fact, you know, we study history a lot. I I would think the Soviets and maybe what Russia is trying to become again, but the Soviets for sure, that would be a lesson. And Islam throughout its history are the only two that you really can't negotiate with. They only respond to force. They are going to defeat you or you must defeat them. That's the only two things they respond to. And I think a lot of people learn a lot of bad lessons throughout the Cold War on appeasement. And I think they're going to lose one on this holy war if they don't wake up. Well, and and the final thought on this one, the question to you on this is, is that I can't think of another. And, and I know that to bring up an argument that's based upon the progressive left being hypocritical within their own construct of doctrines and speech is absurd because the fundamental principle of the progressive left is there is no absolute truth. So they wake up each day in a new world and they're smarter today 
than they were yesterday just because they woke up today. And so they reserve the right to change any opinion at any time for whatever reason that they see is necessary because there is no such thing as truth. It's a moving gold okay. line. I get it. I, I get that. But what's astounding to me is that there can be a wing of the Democrat Party that is pro-Hamas and is attempting to influence American foreign policy when you consider just this one factor alone and that is the incredible intolerance in the structural system. It's almost a caste system inside Islam in regards to the rights of men and women and the persecution of women. A, a woman is not even a whole person. I, I mean, it, it's astounding to me. And the embrace of the, um, of the American population not knowing what it is that they're actually embracing, let alone our government. And it, I guess it drives people nuts because... You know, it drives us crazy because everyone always thinks, well, God, our government's supposed to be the smartest people that are out there. These people are, I mean, how can you not get it when it's as plain as watching people being butchered in the street and, and you're trying to make some kind of deal with this evil? Yeah, I mean, ignorance is bliss till consequence arrives is what it all boils down to. I, you know, there are so many things that come to mind when you have those conversations. I, I don't have to tell you how Islam would treat a homosexual. I don't have to tell you how Islam would handle adultery. I don't have to tell you how Islam, well, they still have slavery. A woman isn't even, they, they're, they're not big on shoplifting either. One of the things, one of the things that concerned me with this story was that, that somebody would see that when I posted it and think, oh, Bethlehem, that's Jews that are not going to celebrate Christmas to try to find, no, 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 not no, they're controlled by the Palestinians. So what, what, should, what should be concerning to you is, the same Palestinians that elect and continue to give control to Hamas, a terrorist organization, are doubling down. They haven't learned their lesson. If there was an election held tomorrow, they'd probably reelect Hamas. They clearly have solidarity with them in terrorizing and kidnapping and killing, which, by the way, I think is lost in Western culture. We do still recognize that the greatest act of love is to sacrifice your life for someone else. Uh, we do acknowledge that with our those that give their life in service to our country. Islam, you don't understand when when you saw those little pro cameras and they were breaking in and they were killing pol Israeli police officers or killing innocent people on the streets, and they're like, it's like a hoot nanny. It looks like an old fashioned Pentecost. They're dancing, singing. What the West doesn't understand is this is the highest calling. This is the ultimate way to die, and it is promised to provide the ultimate eternal reward. They are worshiping like we fall on our knees and worship God. When they're doing these acts, they don't see it as terrorism. They see it as worship. This, this is the wall where you can't communicate with them. Oh, if I give you this lamb, will you... What could you give me, David, that would keep me from worshiping my God? I'll denounce this country. I would denounce this family before I stopped worshiping God. So there's this whole disconnect that goes beyond, I think, even ignorance. I don't know if the far left plays these things like pianos and no one will really remember or hold them accountable for any dangerous appeasement that emboldened an aggression that led to 9-11 or remained ignorant and unprotected from to come back in nine, from 93 and back again on 9-11, I think that they're staring at um, a far left portion of their party that wants to take over the party. So they know what they're instigating. And the rest of them are looking at Biden's polling numbers and they're prioritizing an old president who probably couldn't win anyway. And the ability for him to have any numbers whatsoever heading into the primary season over the security of not only their most trusted ally and well-earned ally, but the security of the region and the world. So it would make sense that as we look at an election in 2024, one of the questions I know I'm going to have to be asking is, do the people that are asking me for my vote understand what Islam is? Do they understand the true threat that's involved here for the United States? It's kind of like Christmas time right now, and the lights are off in Bethlehem. The conversations are just getting started. To get connected, check out 1850MainStreet.com. 
We don't data mine anyone or sell your information. Subscribe today so you don't miss a single conversation. We'll see you next time here at 1850 Main Street.